Here. I am particularly excited about this conversation, which I think is an interesting conversation for graphic designers, interactive designers, typesetters, uh, type designers, and everyone in between, and the students of the discipline, especially now that things are we're turning into a world of screens. Um, and we're very fortunate to have here today, work on my intros here, Juliet Cesar, who is designer, writer, assistant professor of communication design at the New School. Parsons School of Design, currently on sabbatical, author of this lovely book that everybody should get and read and use in their classes. Today, <laughs> right now, on Amazon, John Gamble, senior critic at the Yale School of Art and the Yale University printer. One little anecdote, um, John was my professor. Uh, I was fortunate enough to have him, and I, I indelible in my memory is learning the difference between hyphen and dash and end dash. But more specifically, in Quark Express, the proper setting of an M dash, 70% horizontal scale with option spaces on either side. Make it a Quark. Quark. Quark, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Amy Papalius, assistant professor of graphic design at SUNY New Paltz and co-founder of Alphabets, a really fantastic blog about women in type that everyone should check out. And Thomas Jockin, adjunct professor at Queens College and the founder of the International I Type bet. Thursday, National <laughs> Type Thursday. Thanks. Going national. Okay. So our, we have four questions and we're going to ask each panelist, uh, we'll, we'll start with a question that each, we hope each panelist can answer. And then we'll go to the next question. <clears throat> and we hope to do that for about an hour, and then we'll have an hour of questions from you, and then reception. So do you want to ask the first question? Okay. So given that type skills take time to learn and dedication to teach, what do you all consider to be the most effective ways to teach type in an undergraduate curriculum? And a little bit of a sub-question on that is, how do you think that American schools are doing in teaching type art? So let's start with Juliet and move across. Unless <laughs> someone else is ready to speak. You'd be contrarian if I speak first. You will be. That's, that's, that, that's totally fine. Well, uh, I mean, this is a good opportunity, as any, to, to say, like, I've been very critical of how we teach type for a long time, um, mostly because I, you know, I did not, I didn't have a formal education in, in type, so I learned it all through practice, and so when I started teaching, and I was given, like, the way to teach type, and then I saw, especially with the types of students that I was teaching, sorry, types of students, um, that, that they were not understanding any of it, like, so that's, like, one, so that's one phase, this is 15 years ago or so when I first started teaching, so already I was thinking, are we doing this right? And then later, now you know, now I'm at Parsons, mostly I teach in the senior year, and we often have you know, students who show up who have like a love for things like drop caps or small caps and other kind of pieces of type, like type features, but then they, I, they, they can't set a paragraph of type and I can't figure yeah. out like where where things are missing and so uh, what I've been doing this is partially like what's in this book too is like over the years as a teacher I've been trying to develop a, a language about how to teach type that's completely outside doesn't use any jargon whatsoever um, just because like I think this we, we romanticize this idea of like it being this esoteric thing that is made by elves and like if you learn the elf language, like you will learn. Like, people get so students get stuck in the language, and they especially get stuck in the vocabulary. And for the most part, they're not students to begin with who are really into. I mean, this is not you know, especially when we use like, things like anatomy, for example. Like, here's a student who would never pass an anatomy class, really. Like, let's be honest. Um, and yet, like, we're teaching them type, which is kind of easier to learn than human anatomy, but using the same method you would use to teach anatomy. So, like, what are we doing? So, I, you know, I, I, I'm really, um, in terms of, so I'll say, like, I don't, I can't, I, I, we would have to be here all day for me to say, like, what I, what I think works, actually, is, like, just 
brute force practice, like just practice, 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 look, 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 critique, critique, critique. I think that works well. I've seen it work. Um, I think that other method, though, of introducing it as a, uh, a, a kind of separate realm that has its own kind of language kind of thing, it's, it's romantic. I like it. It's, it's, it's attractive in a lot of ways, but I, I don't think it works. I don't think that students come out of that process. Uh, feeling confident and actually like feeling like this is right and this is not right. They, they get lost in, they, they ask me questions about type sizes and they set everything in Baskerville. Like this is, this is like a thing with Parkinson students in particular. Two columns, Baskerville, drop cap. Um, and, and I have no idea given that there are literally millions of options for how to set text, like why that? Because, and, and when I ask them like why did you do that, they say, because my teacher told me that Oscar was a good typeface, and then, and then my my head explodes at that point. <laughs> there's, no, there's no way to. So so I mean it's a point of I, I think I think it's a really good time for us to, and I hope we explore this today. Like of, of really thinking like is the way is is introducing it as a, a thing with its own language is our our effort to make it something important, keeping people from being able to access it. I'm going to sort of disagree. You can be the <laughs> yes, that's why I wanted but to I'm, last. I'm disagreeing yeah. in, in a certain context. <laughs> yes, thanks a lot. Which is, is that um, I teach exclusively uh, at this point uh, students who are, uh, are coming into uh, a graduate program, but for a preliminary year. They tend to be people who've had a good undergraduate uh, liberal arts very often education. They tend to be readers. They they uh, already kind of know they want to do typography and design. And so I think actually the romance is a bit of a hook mm -hmm. uh, occasionally for this for this crew. I, 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 I don't know what I'd do if I were sat in front of a group of students that, of the kind you just described. <laughs> I, I would tear my hair out. <laughs> but, um, uh, I think that, uh, yeah, in, in my work, I start primarily uh, from uh, reading. I have uh, essentially just three assignments, but the core assignment is what I call a little book assignment, where we, uh, they choose a uh, brief text, and then we just work extremely hard on figuring out how within the confines of a kind of, uh, uh, you know, almost a crystal goblet sort of approach, uh, we imagine that it's possible to design in such a way that you are, you, you know, the, the, the modest maker of a of a uh, beautiful piece of craft work, and and that you are your your goal in doing this is to um, uh, to uh, make uh, accessible the, the the content. It's a very old, very romantic way of looking at it. And it's just you know one of the three things that we do, but but the point of it is to get people to begin to really rationalize why they make any choice that they make, to be able to figure out why the book or this little booklet is the size that it is. I think of that as just as much a part of typography. Why the paper is this flexibility? Why the grain is this way? Why it smells this way? Why it's bound with a staple instead of a string? Anyway. It's that the whole point, I think, is, is connecting people uh, uh, to, uh, to typography through um, uh, creating by any number of different means some sort of formal, formal um, expression, reflection, uh, manifestation of, of that, that content. Can I come take a <laughs> um, so I was just thinking about this. So the ten years that I've been teaching, I've never taught a straight-up typography class. I've pretty much taught everything else from you know basic freshman 2D design to senior thesis to interaction design, web design, uh, everything else except the the type class. Um, and so for me, um, I, I try. So the, the, the context in which I'm teaching is in SUNY New College, which is a state university, about half of our students are transfer students. So we have a really mixed bag of students coming in with skills and interests, 
Um, and there's a lot of unlearning that has to happen in terms of what they were taught. You know, we don't know what they know yet. And so there's that first semester dance of trying to figure out what do you know? Who taught you this? Who introduced you to the font? Like, let's have that conversation. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You know, establishing like the ground rules as a. <laughs> um, but you know that that you know he, here are some things you've heard about this or that you know about this already, and then you know here's maybe why that works or doesn't work, and then here are some other approaches to that. And um, I, I think the goal too is not to make anybody feel particularly stupid or you know uninformed or that you know that, that this is that we're learning together and and to try to make it feel like a pretty feel good environment. Um, I also think that the, the this idea of the, the, the T learning, the wide and deep, um, is an interesting approach to type in, in terms of thinking the, the very broad kind of overview things, but then also the the really deep learning and and where that happens in the curriculum. Um, can can be really interesting. I'm, I'm seeing like a lot of like nodding heads throughout all this stuff, which I'm really excited for the time that we can exchange. Yeah, yeah well, I I generally agree with most of the comments. I know there's some contradiction, but for me personally, the idea is my students usually. So it's Queens College is a weird university. It's I didn't even know it. Existed. Quite frankly, I got an application to like, teach there. I was like, really? They exist? It's a thing. I have to say, but in gen but with that said, I think the students, while their baseline of knowledge is relatively low, they're very enthusiastic and want to learn. And I think as a teacher, that's my great, great privilege is to have that. It's the, most, the most important thing is engagement. If they're not engaged, they're not learning. And I know as a professor, I have that responsibility to, I could talk all day about the anatomy and the language about type, but if they don't know what I'm talking about and con like the concrete meaning of those terms and what their relationships are to other things, it, doesn't, it just goes right over the head. I, could, I sense that. I usually focus very hard in the first half of the semester of a type one class on exercises that draw out technical skills and very minutia focus. It's super focused on cutting out letters, breaking about negative space relationships, you know, and then in demonstrations discussing using the language in that context. Like, oh, look at the arch, look at the joint, look at this. And then using a very repetitive process to cross examine at different styles, kind of these kind of type one methodology. So if some things are fixed, they can use as a cross reference across different styles. The point is that they hate it. Most <laughs> students like the only reason why they they, buy, they go with me is because I do it with them. So I have to sit there for four hours every week and cut this out and put it on the on the board with them. I, I, you, I lead by example to show that I'm doing it, so I don't want to hear any of you crying that you need to spend four hours cutting out letters. Um, but the results pay out because when you get to like Garamond to Dito and you realize those syrups get really, really thin, they have to cut this out and they have to feel that pain of realizing that something happened there versatile. I could talk and I'll usually open that course, that lesson, and go, guys, well, how was that assignment? And they'll all cry about it and they're like, that's insane. Um, Great, so let's talk about the technology reasons why this happened, why this shift happened. I have to give them a demonstration of context about, and they have to experience it themselves in their own, in their own. Haptic. Yeah, just, <laughs> yeah, just in, their, in their own subjectivity of their own existence beyond my own telling them what to think, you know, and then give the context of why this matters or why this phenomenon is going on. So you're starting with the letter forms, yes. they're cutting out letter forms and they're examining the typeface design. So starting Correct. really with the letter form and understanding why letter forms are constructed in certain ways and then building how the larger discipline of, of uh, the larger design of typography builds on Builds on it. Yeah, that's the point. You start as a type designer, I choose micro and then I scale up. My type one class and type two go up and I was asked to teach a type design class. So then they go, we go down. It's exactly the same methodology, but it's always from the same place. Just where I go depends on the course I'm asked to teach. Because uh, usually, for example, in type one, you'll go from individual letter forms to then letting. Because we'll explain that's why this isn't there. He's in their space. And then you just start scaling up uh, from there. Usually it's three assignments per course. That's usually how it goes. Right. But it sounds like a very different approach than John is taking, where you're approaching really looking at the reading in the paragraph and looking at it really from the overall right. setting of the yeah, but, but what you say makes sense to me because um, it's sort of holo holographic if it's done right. You know, you, the choices you make about the proportion of the page 
work them, themselves down into the proportion of the letter potentially. Yes. And then there's expressive potential in whether you choose a you know a, a letter with a, a tall aspect ratio as opposed to one that's wide or vice versa, creating tensions, formal tensions that might reflect you know content tensions. It's uh, you know a lot of times yeah. it's more intuitive than that and not quite as but but I I get where you're. We do, we do the same sequence, but like Parsons has a type core class in the sophomore year, and we also do micro to macro. Is the, it's kind of a, I mean, it's also a compromise because we have seven sections, and so everybody needs to be able to kind of grasp, like, what are we doing? So uh, it's much easier to, it's much easier to understand sequence, but we need students and the faculty to do it that way. I'm not convinced it's exactly the right way to do it, but because uh, it doesn't start with the reader. Like I, I would prefer to start with the reader, but not everybody can teach it from that perspective. So we, we go with that. So you have seven sections in order to keep them all. <laughs> times 10. 10. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that they all are teaching the same thing. There's this a pretty yeah, articulated so we, syllabus. In order, to, in order to be able to, I mean, our problem, because of the scale of the school, which is very similar at other large schools, is uh, we need to know when they go into the next thing what they learned. But we also can't. We can't dictate like the class like step by step because then no one will teach it. So, so we try to kind of break the difference by proposing sort of units and learning outcomes and hoping that that will that will do it. But there's still because of the whole terminology thing and because people don't agree on terms it's a hot on mess. anything yeah. in this field, mm -hmm. uh, it's Widows really and hard. <laughs> 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 and, and there's, there's no there's it's still it's still really hard to. to Determine which students do you need to teach again, all over again, and which ones do not have to do that. And that's the thing that I mean, from an administrative perspective, is like that's the loss. Is like if I, if the student comes into my class and I have to teach them everything from the beginning, then we didn't we didn't we didn't do such a great job. Like we should we should have figured out a way to do teaching. I, I'm curious about the contrast between Thomas and John, between the, the ways you both describe starting. Because, uh, John, it sounds like um, you're starting from a point that gives the students a reason to, to do typography, to, to use type. There's a text. And if they're familiar with text, they like text. I, I wonder if any of you um, feel that more work has to be done up front to, to Educate students on why type is important. If you're not starting from that place, you know, if you're starting from the shape of a letter, is it harder to pull them into the craft, into the practice, because it's getting up so close, you know, to letter forms? Do you feel like at some point they have to be reminded, oh, this we're doing this because you will eventually be designing a book or, a, yeah. you know, no, it's I said that in the first my first reply, it's just, you know, it's. All about buying. If I don't buy in the students from the get go, it's gone. It's the, you're gonna, it's gonna completely fall, shatter completely. So this is not even related to curriculum, but what I always do my first class is I do what's called a name game. So I have to go through every single student. I ask for their name and something unique about them that's not related to the type in any way. And then I have to I'll go through the names and I have to play it back all the way through. So it takes like half the first core class to do it. It seems completely esoteric. But the fact that the next next course, I go and say, boom, I just play it out. Like I, I took the time to memorize the students' names. That kind of extreme level of dedication to my students, they have to respect that. They, and I do. They very much, they understand, they really do respect that. I care about them that much. And for that reason, you pointed out, it's so abstracted, I can't give them the big reveal until like three quarters of the course. Mm -hmm. When they go, oh, it's all this proportion stuff. And that was the biggest stuff you're talking about. I can make this cool page now and a cool poster. I, bet I have to keep them going up to that point. You know, in a very technical skill focused discipline like this, that's super hard. Uh, so I have to make all those massive investments along the way. It's part, it's, I see that as, as a very core important skill of my job. Well, but I mean, part of your question is like, can you have some respect for typography without having some respect for reading? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, and people have, different people have different opinions about that. Like, I mean, and that uh, should lead into yeah. our ne the question that we have, do you think the relationship between reading, literacy, and literacy um, is, is, or what do you think is the relationship between reading and literacy and education and typography? How important is it to read? And I remember being at one of your critiques 
And the critic there was um, said, if Andy Pressman. You, you have no business setting type. And he just said it. Like, he basically said, if you fact, don't read, like, you, you have no read. business being a graphic designer. No business well, setting type. That's, yeah. Yeah. And that's everybody a said. Well, <laughs> and I said, well, and you said, well. It was a great point. It was, well, it's the, but there's reading and there's reading, you know? And I'm, mm -hmm. I, 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 think, I think one of the, th the sort of heart of my thinking about it is something I got from Alvin Eisenman. He said, in his way, looking up, you know, you go like, there are really only two kinds of type: text and display. <laughs> and, um, and so that's that's kind of what I figured out. And you know, and in, in so when I teach, I, I think of you have to be a reader. To, I think, but again, categorical. But you more or less have to be a reader to set uh, to set a, a meaningful and effective page of reading type for print. You don't have to be a reader. In fact, it might even get in the way of your being a reader to do a good poster. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know. I see them as being quite different activities, but they tend to get mashed together both in teaching and in uh, and in professional practice. Um, you know, it took most of the 20th century to sort that out. <laughs> um, <laughs> Which is which is absolutely true. It's like you know, if you're if you're not if you're if you don't play video games, it's kind of like why would you make a video game? Or how are you going to make a video game if you don't play wow, video that's games? Perfect. That's so perfect. <laughs> not that you can't learn anything from yeah, making a video game. Absolutely. There are other secondary things that you learn by doing that. But if you're not actually if you don't love it, like it's very difficult to do. But the the I I I'm, I'm example number one of John's. Uh, if you if you are a reader, it gets in the way of like, like this stuff amazes me. Because like I I, w I would spend a thousand hours trying to make one of these. We would never, because I I'm so caught up in reading that like I can't I can't get away from that. And, yeah, and, just uh, blowing people's eyes out. <laughs> <laughs> which, is, which is what you know, that's what the best poster's supposed to do. Yeah. It's supposed to draw you up, right? <laughs> and if you can read it to some degree after that, at least the importance that's great. But but really, it's about drawing people. Yeah, and it's interesting too because as you're dealing with a lay audience too, they, they start getting into questions. Like I'm always having arguments now with people about legibility, which I guess is like part comes with the practice. But uh, especially with book covers, I'm always told about. I'm always being lectured on like how legible things are. And, oh. And now, and it's interesting because I've never said a book cover in the last like five years where the words don't go all the way to the edge of the mm -hmm. book because I know mm -hmm. that if it's any smaller than that, that I'm going to be told mm -hmm. to make it. So it, it should be legible. It should be extremely well, it's just, legible. It's just like the, 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 and this has to do again with terminology, like the terminology that, that lay people use is, is it's that it's about legibility. They feel like they own that as their, their term. And well, anybody actually, anybody. And so the, there's a, there's like this, the exchange like starts to can, can get complicated where you're, you're in the case where you're, you're, you're you have a display uh, purpose the person, rather than saying, like, it doesn't blow my eyes out, they say, it's not legible. And then, of course, if you're a read, reader, you're like, but it is leg legible. You know, like, so it's kind of a very interesting non-conversation that results from that. So, anyway, But that's interesting in a teaching point of view, is how it is, is when to, when to, um, uh, or what, 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 what do you teach at various points in a, in a, in a, project, for example, sometimes, I mean, for example, I think it's pretty common, but we do a, a book jacket project where part of it is about blowing your eyes out. The other part of it is usually some kind of uh, flat copy or blurbs. And then why is it suddenly not decently set type? You know, why, why in, unless there's some point to it being also uh, essentially just about attraction. Um, so, so that's kind of fun in, in you know, in, in, in the teaching moment to figure out when you're promoting what and then hoping all along that, uh, that, that the students uh, have carried the lesson from the text typography along into the into <coughs> other work that they do and, and that some work that even includes display. What, what about for you guys though? Like how are your students, what's their relationship to reading? So, um, well, you know, because New Paltz is a you know, liberal arts school and uh, they do have a pretty substantial general education 
requirement, which forces them to do maybe more reading than they wanted to. But that's okay. <laughs> Where is it in forces? But go yeah. On. No, absolutely. I mean, it, it, it's, it's a good thing. I think the other thing is the connection with reading and writing and, and making writing a really integral part of the design education. I know that John Mayer just like, that's like the big buzz unicorn thing now is being a writer. But, um, but there, there is something to that of that they, that, that can be another way to kind of get them excited about type is if they can possibly use their own writing, hope, you know, maybe later on down, down the road. Um, but but that, that, they, that there's some ownership and some connection to the text too. I think that can, that can be a method um, to encourage exploration, experimentation, investigation. Yeah. I mean, generally quite similar answer is no engagement. I mean, not, not at least to my knowledge, my own <coughs> students, when it comes to academic reading background. On the general, on the initial question about, do you have to be a reader to produce text? And that's the issue of engagement. If you're just <coughs> producing copy, just a fill copy, this is kind of, like, I, what I generally do for my text examples is, they're not allowed to use Lord Ipsum. Like, it's just, what well, I know, but the point is, like, it's this yeah. filler copy just for the sake of filling boxes. That just, that's categorical disengagement from a writing process. But with my students, I have my students for a text project is they have to do interviews with members. It's great because also, again, um, I have basically spot like a series of questions or discussion about what they're doing in the class and why they're there and why it's important for them. And then they have to set it, right? So one is that it creates an hour effect that I get to learn more about my students as a result. And it's again, more concrete. It's actually a thing they add or produce. Not very well, the writing is a mess. Um, but that's not the point. The point is I want them, I need them to be engaged in the content. Uh, but that's, I had to invoke that. I had to impose that into the structure of the course to allow that to happen. It was not gonna be there for the students by themselves. I mean, I do find also that even when the students create their own content, they still have issues making the jump to setting the content correctly. They still don't really read what they're setting. Sometimes there'll be a weird line break, and they're just not quite, I still see like a disconnect between the, either their reading skills, their connect, but I think it's more their connection to setting text and setting readable text, regardless of if they've been reading their whole life. It's the language of setting it is something that they really practice, 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 and even more, they really need to learn. And I think that, for me, one of the curious things about teaching is like, how do you really teach people to actually like set good text? And it may be in a book, it may be in a magazine, it may be on the web, it may be anywhere. Maybe if it's going, you know, and that's a, a, to the next point, I guess, is like, do we need to start thinking differently about typography education as we move into a world of screens? Like, is it a different thing? Yeah, we're not gonna set the, main, set the same amount of text, the same kind of text on the screen. Good. Could I ask one sort of general question before? Uh, we've been using the words correct and good. <laughs> Do you believe there is good and correct text typesetting or typesetting in general? So, or like, what is that? <laughs> because I think I've heard you know, some professors questioning that. And I think it's one of those things that scares off students. Oh, there's a correct, you know, there, there's, there's some bar here I've got to meet. Or, well, <laughs> you know, right, right, right. <laughs> I think there's correct typesetting, like there's correct writing. You know, I mean, there's no, the, you have to know how that thing is read, like you have to know how it's received in order to, and if it's not being received in the way that you intended it, it's incorrect. I mean, like there's no, uh, that's, a, that's a problem with graphic design education in general is this idea that, that design is subjective, like it bothers me deeply because students come in thinking all these objective things that was, that I was terrible at, like finally I can leave them all behind. <laughs> you know, all that reading, all that lousy reading, all the, all the math, the whatever, like finally, like I, I have gotten the golden ticket, I'm, I'm, gonna get a, I'm gonna get a graphic design degree and I will never have to do any of that stuff ever again. And then, and then comes like this like total balloon popper who comes along and says like, well, you know, actually if you're not reading all the time, if you're not, you know, if you can't measure anything, you're gonna have a really hard time, and and it's it's uh, it's but it's it's because of I mean I'm, I, I, this is a string to pull like for me it's like the way the uh, the business of design education is bigger than the business of design and so much advertising is out there that basically says like if you can get a degree in this field like you can just you know it'll be flowers and you'll be like one of those people who has like a 
a color palette in front of you, in front of the screen, and like, oh, look, these images are coming into our minds, and they're burning into everybody else's minds. And, they, and so you're sitting there, and they go through four years, a lot of them, of like being told, like, actually, no, that's not how it works. But it's like, but I was promised. And, and you are, I mean, you're really running against a, 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 a whole uh, kind of framework of how they thought the world works. And then you're coming back in and you're saying, well, actually, no. Like, if you get a degree in this, you don't know how to read or write or do math and set type or whatever. Like, it's not going to get you anything. Like, it's, it's such a downer. So, anyway, I'm sorry. I lost the thread of you for that. No, that's great. That's but, great. like, it's, it's a. a but the whole question of being correct and doing things correctly. I mean, there's, a, and, and now is a good time to say, there are class issues involved in that too. The correct text for, correctly typeset text for, is, is a, uh, a, you know, there's, there's, there's a, there are levels to that. There are, you know, if you're in one class versus another class, you have different ideas about that. And like, so I think you're very cagey in, telling somebody like no like don't do it like that you do it like this because this is the way that like fancy elite people set their text and read their text and, and do their thing and it's a really hard question because for you not to do that then is to like say no you will you stay where you are mm -hmm. you know like so that, so how do you then you can't say like any, anything can be anything goes and not yeah there's a lot of postmodern kind of uh, sidestepping and and Mincing of, mincing of words. words in order to, to, to teach at all yeah. in many cases. But. So, I mean, I would, of course, anybody's free to do whatever they want, but like, I think to, to say no, it's all subjective is, is, a, is, is not a good <coughs> Amy and, and Thomas, do you have some ideas about what is good typography? Correct. I mean, I think it's, uh, there's, there's a, the question about exposure that, that you were talking about, and, and so, you know, we, we think that our students are so um, savvy and they like know all this stuff already and they come <laughs> in and they're like, they know what a graphic designer is, but they're, they also may not have the exposure to, um, you know, what, what we think of as, as good type or this kind of modernist canon. Um, and so I, I, think, I think it's our role to say, like, to, to show them examples of, of what we feel is successful um, but also to help them articulate why they think something is successful. So, you know, anytime we're, I've got like my mountain, of my wagon of TDC manuals that I like drag out. <laughs> and we, you know, we spread them all out. And they're all looking, like, oh, that's cool, that's cool, that's cool. And then it's, you know, and then it's just, at, you know, why, the question of why. What makes this cool? Why, you know, I know that you think this is successful for whatever, you know, wherever you're coming from. In your heart. In your heart, <laughs> you feel like, why is this successful? What is making it work? And I have a student here, and like over and over, former student, he's working in, for, you know, like over and over again, like being able to look at something and, fit and, and articulate why that is successful. And it, there's this idea of intention, you know, so even if it looks weird and it's stretched and it's that like RISD Pogo thing, like, it, you know, like it's still, there, there's an intention there, right? There's a, there's, that's different than the like bad stretched subway ad type. And so being, being able to have the, the language to talk about what you see, um, I think that does rub off on their understanding of, of good type and that, that this is a, um, a, a, a strange, a strange like, like it's okay to question what we think of as good type. Yeah, Amy, I like what you said about intentionality. I think that's... So for me, the great question of goodness comes from the question of intentionality. Like most of the time, when they're, when they're usually when, the, when it's the train wreck project, and it goes up on the wall and we get critiqued. I'm going to ask a series of questions about what was your thought process behind this, and what about this? What about this relationship to that? What was your thought process behind, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. They're going to say I don't know almost consistently, and it, it usually works as my metric how to deal with this goodness or rightness question. For me personally, it's about intentionality, what they're trying to do. Um, Usually they just don't have the answers to those questions, and it's by critique demonstration like that it, ex it exposes those points. And because that's tied specifically how I'm going to evaluate their projects, that's how I deal with this problem personally. Um, obviously, it's also my own personal for subjectivity of what I think is right and wrong. Um, I try to withhold. I just I accept that's part of the reality when I present because I'm doing the projects to with them, so that there's obviously my example are used, and, they, and I see them constantly looking at it as an example. Uh, 
that combined with the style of critique is usually how I deal with this question of rightness or correctness uh, per se. So I get You're that. still putting it in quotes though, so you don't believe in it. Mm -hmm. Do you think that it I think I, 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 here's what I, what I mean by that is when we say that, what we're saying is a shorthand to just to challenge, they're saying that what is the grounds of this argument or what is the grounds of the point, right? There is, if it's truly the correct answer, it should be testable to evaluation or to challenging of why. If it can't be, then it's just a taste preference or it's something, it's something subject, it's actually inherently something subjective. Uh, so, Personally, as a, I guess I am a postmodernist in that sense. I guess we can put it that way. You've exposed yourself. I guess I have. Yeah. I am exposed. But I don't think. But I do think there is an idea of a. There is a like intention, a pro, intentionality of the project, as we discussed. Idea of book covers, right? There's a cover which is meant to be extravagant to blow your eyes out, and then there's text on the flaps and on the back that does a different job, right? So the context and intentionality has shifted. And you, as a designer, have to respond to that requirement, uh, and that and those are the things that I get exposed. And you, I can challenge you on on that. I accept the groundwork of the critique on these points, and I can challenge you on that. And that's usually usually we get to we get to a, what what's considered correct or what's considered a reasonable solution to the problem. Uh, I, I guess I'm personally I'm uncomfortable using. It's similar to the point when like people tell you, Baskerville is always the best typeface, and always set it in two columns or whatever, and with a drop cap. Is that true? Is that a truth, or is that a, a subjective preference? Well, I don't think that's good typography, but yeah. <laughs> but someone else did. That person of authority did in that in that student's context, uh, life experience. So that's why I'm here, that's why I need to get I try to get around as much as possible. I think too this this question about good typography. We're we're talking about a lot of you know I think when we think about good typography, we we automatically think about printed things mm -hmm. um, as opposed to screens as somehow they're they're somehow totally different and separate. <coughs> I do think that um, students are more pass more passively um, consuming screen type and we're not thinking about it as an extension of the same rules <laughs> applying to how we think about setting book text to how we're thinking about the web. So when I'm teaching web design, I'm spending the same amount of time talking about what makes this type on this website work well? Why does the type on this app work well? Why is it working well uh, on a desktop versus on a mobile screen? You know, what, again, like articulating what is actually going on here that's making these relationships work and not work. Um, and I, I think that's sometimes we do forget that. Don't you, don't you think that when we do think of correct or good typography types, I mean, we usually think about text typography rather than display. Mm -hmm. do, would you agree? Yeah, I agree completely. I've, I've often thought it'd be fun to uh, actually write an essay about about the, um, uh, the moral dimension of typography, how how it got to have a kind of moral overtone, like like how we get away with saying it's good type. Um, and it, it's really it's really extraordinary. I, I don't know what it is. Maybe it's left over from from uh, you know the. Uh, you know, the origins of, of, of letterpress printing and the guild system and who knows what, but but there's a real, there's a, there's a real kind of moral, uh, uh, you know, bolt of lightning that runs through uh, typography. It's, it's very, uh, it's, a, it's very palpable. It's interesting because in, oh, no, go ahead. In, in having a conversation with people about this panel, I realize that there's a lot of fear factor involved in teaching type and probably in learning type as well and I wonder if part of it is that there's this good like and bad. Like, but right. Yeah, the there's a, the force of darkness and the light and like <laughs> we have to do it right. It has to be like if we're going to teach people type we have to teach them the good correct way right. whether or not we know what that is. Yeah. I'm fascinated that you brought up class. Um, yeah. Could you describe what high class text typesetting is? Basketball, three columns, two columns. Is it a certain number of hyphens in a row, or what is it? Well, I mean, it's well. First of all, you use expensive type, you know, like expensive new type, and you have it. Just bought something from Heffler. Uh, you bought something from from Heffler, preferably a European or, or non-American type boundary, and it's uh, you know, and it's it's set like with. Specific types of like margins. It's always like left justified. Like there's 
there's uh, there's there's a lot of uh, uh, attention paid to the readability or the, the user experience of the type, you know, more than the form of how it sits on the page. Mm -hmm. um, you know, versus, you know, when you, like, you, you even dropped like, like subway ad, right? You know, so the subway ad is not meant to appeal in that way. In fact, all of the, um, uh, you know, Oscar, or other kind of like subway, the subway ads that are aimed towards very expensive people are all set that way. It's an expensive European type. Mm -hmm. It's like nice color system. You know, it's it's all of it's all, all the kind, and you know, and we and our students get really grumpy for sure because they're just like you just want everything to be in a particular style, but you know, I mean, it's like well, what are the other styles exactly like in 2017 that you want us to teach you how to do? You know, because like that, and and that's when they start like going back in the catalog and they want to make something that looks like it's from 1980. But it's it's a knowing the differences between those things. Knowing differences between anything is a class thing because it means you have time to know those differences. Like you know, for if you don't know anything about wine, all red wine tastes exactly the same. If you have time, energy, money to like learn the differences between wine, you're like, oh no no, like those those two things are that's two different years. Like that's completely different. That discernment itself is a class distinction in anything. And you know, same thing for music. You know, it's like if you know, like all jazz music to me sounds exactly the same. Because mm -hmm. uh, I don't, I haven't spent time listening to it. I don't have it. And like, but if I did, I would be able to tell you, like, no, you know, those are two completely different phases of John Coltrane. They're definitely different. You know, so like, there's no whereas to me now. It's like, well, I don't know. You know, so like, even even knowing those, and in fact, like you know, John was talking about like looking at that one single paragraph and talking about all the fine details of like what happens to the lettings like this versus like this, you know, being able to even tell the difference is itself a class distinction. So that's that's where it, it comes in because you have to have time, energy, money, materials to be able to look at enough of that stuff to be able to actually you know those differences. Well that's sort of what happens in school, isn't it? Yeah. They're, they're actually do have the time. But, but the perception mm -hmm. is that in school you're not doing, you're not learning discernment, that you're learning how to, that you're learning tools, that you're learning like how to make something. And, and it's very, uh, uh, and it's, a, you know, I mean, it's a lie in some ways. Like you're learning how to look at things. But, you know, so, but when you, when, when you promise students that they're going to learn how to make things, and then instead you're trying to teach them how to look at things, of course they get upset because they're just like, I don't care about what you think about the wedding. Tell me what the right lighting is, and then tell me how to set it. I think what you're talking about is connoisseurship. Yeah. Um, and it, when you use that word, it especially sounds classy, classish. Um, do you, don't you think that um, whether or not a school is focusing on connoisseurship or learning to see depends a lot on the faculty? Like oh, it, yeah. That's very personality driven. You know. Definitely. If you want a war in your faculty, you have, you have you have different people from like different levels of, of connoisseurship or whatever, like and then you will see that unfold. And I've seen it at every single school that I've taught at. So they put like a Basel person, yeah, you know, and then like a Calvert person together and just <laughs> steal a huge <laughs> death match. Kind of like, um, wars. This, this this question about type and morality is so fascinating, and I think it, it like that is in the history of type, right? Like from if we just look at arts and crafts movement and just the whole idea of it being connected to a kind of moral state, right? And um, um, uh, Lo Lo Davini is it Davini? Somebody told Divini. me it was Davini. 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 Right, you know, there there was this this uh, sense of it of it being um, a, a kind of more you know to do high quality type was a, a kind of moral righteous thing to do and to do you know cheap you know um, um, books for for everyday folks or you know kind of even feminine type was was considered <coughs> a, a you know. Low. Just low type, exactly. And yeah. so we've always had this high low culture thing. And I think, you know, when we have, I mean, I have students that come in and they're just, they have a set, they have a style already of what they see out in the world, and that's what they're emulating. Um, and I, we as, as educators, we can balance that to say, that's great that you can do this one thing, that this is your style, your interest, and then, hey, there's this other stuff to check out. And 
maybe we can we can work together to, to figure out why where those differences lie and um, but but I, I do think taking a, a kind of a cultural studies approach to type can, can be really fascinating and, and help them get excited about going down that path. Um, do so. Do you think, uh, John? It seems like your approach is very much print-based and editorial. Yeah. Do, yeah. So, do are those the skills that we need, or do should we have a different class for screen type? Should we be looking at things in a different way, or is this the are those the fundamentals that will inform us? Well, I don't know. I'm probably just projecting because I don't teach type for the screen explicitly, but, but I look at screen type and I go, my gosh, you know, this, uh, it's, uh, uh, say there's some kind of responsive page that I look at, look at on the computer screen and then, it, then it's like, it's fine. I look at it on the iPad, it is like very questionable. And I look at, that, look at it on my phone and I, I, it looks great. And, and I think, you know, there's, there's, there's something, you know, there is still, a place for a typographic uh, eye and mind related to this. At least, and maybe it's all in the some kind of envelope that's really hard to define about what's good, useful. But, but, um, but, I think uh, I think that the you know almost everything other than material and uh, and margins <laughs> uh, still applies mm -hmm. in uh, in screen type. So I, I, you know, I can't help but think that that the experience that, that students have in, in uh, you know sexually print related stuff is going to serve them well in other ways, and if not in typographic terms, at least in, in a, uh, attention to what it is that's making something uh, give you the feelings, give you the you know the information uh, uh, in the work that you're looking at. <coughs> Do you guys agree? I think the only issue is, for me personally, this like, this is, so one is, that this assumes your student base has a base of knowledge to even be able to work with this. So this is in CSS, HTML, kind of baseline knowledge. My students don't have that. I mean, if they don't have that base knowledge, how can we, like, this is a certain requirement based requirement. I can't sit there and teach them HTML and CSS. Why not? Also, skills. why do you need to teach them HTML and CSS? So the work on the web, it needs to be, those. Uh, that's my understanding. But you can prototype for screens like on, in 5,000 different ways. Like you don't ever have to open up HTML and CSS. In fact, even you, like when they go work somewhere, generally speaking, they do not have to open up HTML and CSS. I mean, I personally believe you should learn HTML and CSS just, for, just to learn programming for esoteric reasons, like not, not functional reasons. But you can teach screen typography without ever touching a programming language. You certainly can. I would say one of my bias towards materiality and kind of getting to the nitty gritty of things. How text is rendered on the screen, to my knowledge, I mean, is drastically differently when it's made, when you make, make an image out of it versus when it's on text. It just res, it just responds differently. So again, my bias towards materiality. I want my students to be working materially with the thing. So I agree with you. Yes, you could modify it. Um, I think this causes it causes new it causes when new. They said I don't have the base knowledge to talk to teach that. And it's kind of this weird siloing effect. I think there's this, te there's like this tension where we come from a, a lot of us from a print background, and the web has this different grand grain to it that I think how to respond to it would be very, it's important. I think eventually it needs to be dealt with, but as of right now, I don't see that happening at the moment. What's curious is that we do our work on screens. You yeah, we're the screen. screen. Yeah, so we're <laughs> in our just day to day interaction. We're sort of learning what happens on screens, at least. I'm constantly saying, I know this is going to be too big if I print it out, look and write on the screen, this kind of stuff. That's kind of interesting. I suppose if I were working for the screen, I'd be feeding that, that information into it. But, um, so I want to make a case for teaching each two months. Um, I, I think it's actually fundamentally important to the role of, of being able to be a designer who is in control of what you know, what the possibilities are for web type. Um, and I think most designers are just 
it's, it's really hard to sort of be aware of the possibilities um, if we don't understand how it gets there, right? That it's not just like drills in the machine that put the, 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 the type from your Photoshop PSD to the internet, right? Like how that works in control on the fourth floor. On the fourth floor, yeah, the elves, right? The elves, but because I mean, I think if you unlock that key, if you unlock that door and you show them that, it's like this magical place where all of a sudden they have control and they understand what is possible with that? Because I think you know, there's this, there's this, there's this fear. This I, I hear students all the time. They're like, "I'm not a web designer. I'm a print designer." No, you're not, right? Like, you are going to do stuff on the web, for, probably. I'm, you know, it, and it's not condolences, and it's not, I'm sorry, and it's not a compromise. Like, this is the world that you're entering into, and if you, you know, it, I, I think there's. So one of the things that we've been trying to do with our type class um, is is have them do type specimens both um, in InDesign and then in HTML and CSS. And, and the excitement, like when they see that they can actually do it and it works, that is like the most magical experience for them. Because they, they feel this like huge sense of pride that they've made this thing actually happen. Um, and they understand the process behind it. And then that they could actually work with a developer and be articulate and be really thoughtful and not just say, hey, make my thing look like that. Cool, you got it. Because probably the developer is not going to understand type. Um, and then maybe they can become more of an intermediary to say, I understand how the type is getting from here to here. I understand you're telling me this. Can you know, and they, and they can get into that nitty gritty a little bit more. So that's my that's my argument. I'm going to agree with you. Uh, on, on, on that one. I mean, it's also a matter of understanding type as a system instead of like a thing, um, you know, so that you understand that you set, let's say, headline copy all in one way and you learn, if you know how to do that in HTML and CSS, when you get back into InDesign, you're like, there's gotta be an easier way to do this. And then you're like, oh, look, there is, how about that? Um, you know, so just understanding the system, understanding type of system is such a critical skill because we're not doing face up by hand. But also, like, I mean, just to kind of go into a more uh, ancient argument, it's like, why do we teach letterpress, like, in school? Like, do we do it because our students are going to go and, like, set type in letterpress studios? Like, no, they're not. You know, we understand, for some reason, we're able to understand teaching letterpress as a way of understanding how to type of space and how it's put together. But when it comes to HTML and CSS, we see that as being, like, some sort of, like coding skill or whatever that a student may or may not want to put on their resume. You know, like we don't we don't see it as like a making of like a kind of hands-on craft skill to like be doing it that way. And it's not because they're going to go on and do that. Like they probably you know they're probably going to be working in mixed teams with developers and, and whatnot. Like so, but it's it's uh, but even if I mean this is my plea to uh, to everyone. You know. You do not need to know HTML and CSS to teach type on screens. You don't need to know any of it. You know how to look at things. There are plenty of both prototyping programs available as well as you can open up Tumblr. Tumblr is a platform open to everyone and you can just download a theme and open up the drawer and there's HTML and CSS if you want to like just teach somebody how to change stuff around. Like all of this is available to you if with an evening's worth of like research to just to just look at it. I mean for that matter, you know, just to, to be able to like look at things on phones and compare it and talk about it. But like, you can't say like, well, you know what, like can't can't deal with new tricks or whatever and just drop it off. Like you have to, because what happens then is students go uh, continue to be afraid because they, they get they sense that from you. They're like, this person who's smart, who's my professor is already kind of like, yeah, I'm not touching any of that stuff. Like, so why should I? You know, like, I can also stay in this, like, smaller, more narrow realm. And, like, you know, but to say, like, no, here, look, look behind the curtain. Here it is. Like, let's talk about it. Make something for, like, a phone screen that's different from the, the, the thing that you made. You know, what is a book cover right now on the screen? Like, I mean, you can't make a book cover without having to think about the, you know, the legibility on, on Amazon. Oh, no. you know, mm -hmm. yeah. Like have them have them look at that. Like you don't need to know programming to teach that that essential skill. Like you just don't need to know it. And in fact, you your students can know more things than you. Like that's the other thing too. Like you don't need to know any of this stuff. I mean, that's maybe what I learned from my faculty. Like they never knew how to 
make anything for the most part. <laughs> so with that diversity of perspective, I think we should open it up to the audience for questions and other diverse perspectives. Before, just before we do, uh, we had that sub-question earlier that we didn't get to. Do you mind if I no, go just ahead. Uh, throw that back out there if you want to answer it? Uh, if any of you have an international perspective, how do you think American design schools are doing in t terms of teaching typography? And maybe the audience has yeah. an idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Chime in on that, maybe. Start with that. I do admissions at Yale. Yeah. And I don't think, I mean, in general, I would say that the people coming in uh, are, uh, uh, you know, have, have modest typographic skills. I think that it's not as if they're not getting some kind of education, but I would say that that uh, that very seldom do, do we get applications where we're going, oh my god, that's extraordinary typographic work. And probably even less frequency in the course of their two year, two years, for the two year students, do am I at the final uh, show looking around and going, my god, this, this person just really got better at typography. <coughs> it doesn't seem to be, somehow it doesn't seem to be in the kind of mainstream of design education, as I would imagine want to be. Any opinions from, yes? I, I teach uh, at one of the CUNY schools, and so what I see often is students that are either Eastern European or Indian set gigantic type. They love gigantic type. They have Asian students who said tiny type. And I've been trying to sort of be culturally, more culturally aware, right, deciding that maybe Swiss style, we all don't have to do Swiss style. How is this sort of working? I'm also amazed when students are not original English speakers, especially in languages that are not the Latin alphabet, that they're even going in a different direction, that they're setting type and almost learning to read the way we all learn to read, or setting type the way, because as part, as part of reading is you're actually learning that how is type deal, is being set, actually, yeah. right? So there's a lot of these, but I'm but I'm trying to I'm trying to embrace larger type. That's what I want to say. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to say like twelve point type. It's okay. It's okay. And but we'll, we'll also sort of talking about what is actually correct, or what is the what is the rule, or what because sometimes they don't even seem to. I didn't know that there were rules when I started working, and I just did stuff. And then some days somebody said, "You know, there's a baseline grid." And I was like. How many jobs did I send out without knowing there was a baseline grid? Yeah. Um, but I looked up kerning on Google. <laughs> but can you talk about something to say about maybe other, like like literally international type and, and international type style? Is there something to talk about there? Well, perhaps specifically when you're in an American school and to teach these students, uh, are there you know, new challenges or different challenges? And I think it sounds like one is, um, getting them used to the conventions of reading English. Um, like I think if you're like a German speaker, probably you have a different relationship. Mm -hmm. Right? Because the words are so much longer. And you want them to be dark, dark and tight. <laughs> <laughs> All caps. <laughs> dark, <laughs> close. <laughs>
cultures that use other characters, they tend to use more, they start out using big swash fonts. Um, and I, at first, I couldn't understand why. Um, I thought a lot of it had to do with Pinterest and everyone's using swashes. And, but I do think that the nature of the swashes look a little bit more like the characters they're, they're used to using. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I mean, the other thing is centered type, even in a paragraph, it's so hard to get them away from that. Maybe it's because coming from a culture reading from right to left, I haven't figured it out. I, I, it's kind of fascinating to me, actually, to see that progression. But, you know. oh, yeah, I teach at CUNY school also. I find that the cultural context is really tricky. Like the other day, trying to explain to someone that her choice of her script was maybe not what was good for the program. It wasn't even about readability or anything. But she didn't. She didn't have any of the history right. in her head. She knew nothing about its use in the middle of the century. And so I, kind of go back and explain all of it to her. I've even more than once had classes where no one in the room knew what Art Deco was. Wow. I, have, I have a suggestion for you. I'll ask people what modernism is. <laughs> <laughs> I do it in every class, and every class is what keeps me teaching. <laughs> it's, uh, it, you, will, you will, yeah, it's, yeah, Especially when people are coming from different histories, too, and you're learning different world history before coming to the United States. So like, how do you explain what modernism is in a case where modernism in your country like happened in a different time, in a different way, with a different kind of propaganda? With a different, you know, like it's, it's a, we don't have a baseline for a lot of that stuff. Yeah, um, well, with European schools, I mean, there's a rigor at some of the design schools. I think, as you were talking about, in you know, College of Art and so on, why they win awards, uh, where their typography and their understanding and rigor toward text and readability and just beautiful craft um, accepts. Now, there's a whole big difference between technical schools that deal with typography and even here design schools versus the liberal arts school where we're teaching a much more general population and I feel my job is just to get them aware of what beautiful typography is, why there is a difference and they have an inert, what's called inert um, knowledge or threshold of knowledge where they come only knowing what they've learned in Microsoft Word and what they, you know, basically how they're supposed to set papers. So they come in and set it 12 point times Roman or, you know, um, Helvetica or Verdana or Ariel, and that's what they know. And it's all centered. That's what they know. That's what they've been told. So to try to get them to open up their understanding. But I th find this true in Europe. My daughter's at a technical school in Austria, and they are totally clueless in this technical school. And it's sort of, you know, she, we have these discussions about what they teach in the school. You know, it's, um, so I think it really is part of our job in a liberal arts school is just to open them up to what is art deco? Not to punish them for not knowing, but this is a world out there that just enjoy it, embrace it, um, understand it. And if there's something you don't know, and if, you, if I can get a student out excited about looking and about understanding the difference, they might be in jobs where they're, they feel they do need to hire a designer, right? Or type of, or understanding that type and branding has really kind of you know, come together. I, I mean, I, want, we have a, I know we have a few students in the audience, and mm -hmm. I, I won't pick on anyone else's students <laughs> other than my own, but, um, <laughs> you know, I, I just wonder if, if for, sort of from the other perspective, if the students have any thoughts about you know, where they came in sort of with visual cultural um, sophistication around type and where they've come from through some kind of education depending on where they are in a program and, and sort of some of the thoughts that we've heard in the panels. Rebecca, I'm picking on you because you're my student. I yeah, do that. I'm the only one here. <laughs> uh, I would feel that um, on the point of not knowing like modernism and art deco, I think it's very hard for students I think that like it's on a wider scale, it's overwhelming just going to school and, and just making that decision that you're going to study design and then you're going to study typography and you don't exactly like you have this idea of what design is and it's it's everything visual and it's everything that you see but you don't exactly know what that means and 
in the actual sense of now we're designers and we know what design means. Um, and I think it's also because you're so exposed to so much bad design on a, just a wide scale from subway posters to advertising to so just things in the newspapers that you don't really know what that standard is for design when you're a freshman student. You don't know what good typography is or bad typography. You just know like, oh shit, that looks really cool or that looks really bad. And I think that like, it's aside from it being overwhelming, it's difficult for students to find that motivation to want to get more educated about it until they're in the classroom. Like for me, I didn't, re like I wanted to be, I knew I wanted to do graphic design, but I didn't really fall in love with design until I got into type one. And I was like, oh my God, there are 5,000 different types of serif fonts mm -hmm. that all look the same to me before, but now like this crosswire looks different. And I think that once you like have that little burst of excitement as a student, it's easy to either really lose it or really go, or like run with it and get carried away. And I think that like students don't, when you're entering freshman year, you don't have that awareness of like, I should be looking at wider conversations that aren't just in design. I should know what Art Deco is. I should know what modernism is because it like influences design and everything we make. And I think that that's not something students can grasp until later. So there's so. also some conversation about appropriate typeface choices. How do you feel about <clears throat> what teaches you how to make appropriate choices and what um, is that important? There's, a, there's that word appropriate. Appropriate. Well, I think that the word appropriate, like maybe, yeah, maybe swash isn't appropriate, maybe some the other The word type appropriate case. itself feels weird because like what is appropriate? Right. How do you know what that even means in being a freshman or like a, a sophomore graphic designer? You just know, okay, well this looks really, like I'm designing a really expensive magazine cover. I should probably use a serif font because that's where I've seen them used before. Or like, I'm making something for Pinterest, so I'm gonna use that brush script. Like, I think, so based that, on like, I think that it's based on the, the knowledge that you have prior, because we spend so much time on the internet now, and like, I will tell you that it's every student's number one place, the internet. Like, nobody, you like, go and look for a type, no one's going outside, they're gonna Google it. And I think that it's so important because like, teaching the difference between what is that good and appropriate type and what is bad and filtering out all of the junk on the internet and really like zoning in on this is what you should be looking at for inspiration, this is what you should be looking at, not every single thing you see on Pinterest is good. Um. I teach at a Jesuit university so I always tell them there's the Ten Commandments <laughs> and <laughs> there's that great book that, um, I, his name is escaping me, that did. so the first, you tell them the Ten Commandments, these are the rules, and then at fellas, you know, peace about all rules are to be broken exceptionally. But I have, I, I mean, I, I do want to push back on the rules thing, though. Like, it's not about, like, specific rules. No. When students get stuck on specific rules, they're like, how many words to align? And I'm like, no, like, it's not about that. Exactly. And, and so I, I, think, I think we get caught, you know, in terms of correction. Like, correct, correct type doesn't follow rules. Correct type is correct. Like, well, I also but it's like, like yeah, it's like, 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 I feel like we're, ab I feel like we're maybe ab abdicating, <laughs> we're kind of abdicating some responsibility when we are using words like correct, appropriate, right, good, but not giving some sense of what, a, a, a clearer sense of what that is. Well, like, I'll, give, I'll give you one of, one, of, one of my rules that I'm repeating over and over again to every single person who ever comes <coughs> and asks me about something. Things that go together should be closer to each other than they are to other things. It's like the simplest rule of all, all time. It's like a total gestalt yeah. mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. visual foundation mm -hmm. principle. It's like if this title goes with this paragraph, it should go with closer to that paragraph than it is to the previous paragraph. Simple, 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 simple rule. And yet almost nobody like, can figure it. Like it's not there. Like how many words to align? You know, like, like, they expect the rules to have numerical answers, like concrete answers, not relative answers. Well, to that point, I think that the problem for that is that we spent so long in uh, like these systems where you're learning like math and things are very rigid and the rule is the rule and that's the that's the yeah. answer. And so like we we come out of systems where it's like set it twelve point times New Roman justified. That's how your paper has to be submitted. And it's really difficult for yeah, students yeah. to like, break out of those habits where like if if I'm in a classroom in Type One and it says oh eight words is the appropriate line length. I think that students might take that as like word for word being like 
there can never be more than eight words on a line. Okay, but it's really point. difficult for like students to understand that like <laughs> when, when I think it's difficult for students to like get words and that take that to heart. No, but so like I think it's like, like <laughs> don't get like, it's harder for us to get concept on the first go when all we hear is like that rule or like you know like that it's it's not always easy to get the bigger picture that like your paragraph shouldn't be yay long, but they also shouldn't be this. You have to like find that medium. But if we're, if we're talking about um, learning type for, I mean, it, it takes a while. Right? Like hopefully by their senior year, they're looking at the stuff in their sophomore year and saying like, oh my God, what was I thinking, right? Like that's great. I'm so excited when people do that. Cause it's like, yes, you, you learned something. See, like assessment, you learned, you learned something. That's so exciting. Um, so so it, sometimes it takes a while. I'm sorry, I totally okay. I've been a practitioner for about 20 years. I'm an adjunct instructor for about nine years across the classes. And um, I kind of think that the appropriateness and you're saying correct and you know, what's incorrect, I think we're kind of in the weeds a little, like in the details of this paragraph and this word. And it's always been helpful to me to just use a different type of language for that. What's appropriate? Um, nine out of 10 people in the street are not graphic designers. And so what's good to them? instead of what's good to other designers and what's good to the student at, at hand. What I know is good is what every teacher showed me who a master was. These are the masters. That is appropriate, I think that's good. But nine out of 10 people don't know a single masters in typography. And so how do we define those in different terms these days instead of, you know, when's used in dash, you know, a range and an M dash, you know, you know, like, okay, that's cool, but what's appropriate, what's legible, what makes sense? If it's invisible and it feels good, you know, and that audience is like, that feels good to me. Well, describe that in terms that aren't defined in the next textbook that we have for typography. And I think that's incredibly helpful to us to redefine that. You know, what is appropriate? What works? What's legible? So instead of using those terms, use different terminology, use different language. We do it at my job every day. <laughs> right? like, the amount of times we use anatomy, and I work for a really well-known typo. So like the, the amount of times that we actually use the anatomy on the graphic design side is minimal because we're using other words uh, to, to categorize this information. And then I think for me it's always been easier to then redistribute that knowledge to the student you know, instead of being so granular about it, especially in a discussion like this where we're talking about you know, how do we strengthen design education mm -hmm. moving forward, typography within communication with If you're not teaching about typography within the role of graphic design, and how it works with the communication design, and you're teaching only about the fact that you're working in a very parallel model, you know, and you're in a PA system, a VFA system, that in the end result will be a communication design. And so that would run into that a lot, because like, that was part of an assessment program that we had to review an AAS degree and review the sequence of typography. And we saw a lot of problems you know, when we were assessing this, because everybody was working in their own thing and nobody was really connecting the dots. And so connecting the dots was a really big deal. I mean, that was another question that we came up against or came up with about what is advanced typography. And a lot of programs, that becomes a place where it's like more experimental and found type and, Artsy. you know, and is that is that advanced or is there some higher level of learning like typesetting or typographic skill? And I don't know what kind of curricula people have in their programs for type, depending on the size of the program, there may be just two type classes or just one. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting, I don't, you know, what's the next level? Uh, yeah, I'm intrigued by that question of, of is advanced type more self-expressive or is it deeper in the weeds of the craft? Mm -hmm. And, you know. So I, my name is Holly, um, I teach at Kutztown University, and I don't teach advanced type
And so we teach a project based on that, where they take a movie, they design the graphic props, so they have to change the historical context of the film. So they're also going back in history and deep diving into a movement and then appropriating it for that. So we're sort of getting both ends with experimenting and history all in one project. And they do it in eight weeks, so it's quick. Um, but anyway, that's how we do it. We do more experimental. But that's interesting because that's a project where there, it's, there's a right and wrong. Like, if you can nail the historicism, you've got it right. And it's, very, it's going to be very clear if you're wrong. Yeah, you know, and, it's and not purely the biggest subject. struggle, too, is, is learning, is, is helping them understand historical interpretation to design and having them do the correct research to see the actual work. And so their immediate design research is for them to go to Pinterest, but what I struggle with is saying, okay, that's beautiful, but that's somebody's interpretation of type from the 1800s. Like, we have to go back further <coughs> To, to get to the actual original work. So that, that's been one of the struggles with the classes. And I think that we talk about discerning now and, and te having, being able to teach that as well at the same time. Um, so, yeah. Do you have enough time for that for the semester? To go it's through all that weeks. Oh, it's insane. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's an eight week, it's a half semester class. I, I, I will, just to put in a little defense of the internet though, I will say that on the whole, Type, type that has come out of the schools, I think, has been better since we've had the internet, and since we've had Pinterest and all this other kind of stuff. Like, I mean, I know we spend a lot of time complaining about it, but like, I, I've even looked at the work coming out of schools where I used to teach, you know, like UConn and Rutgers, and like the work coming out now, demographically, is way better than it was 10 years ago when, when I was teaching there. Do you think because students are looking at more? I think there's more to look at. I think there's, I think, especially in specific, Places like that, like places like Rutgers Camden, for example, which is one of the, like, a student's scope of what they would see was just so narrow mm -hmm. that that there was just really, you know, so they would, like, we would do this project where you, you make an alphabet out of your environment. I'm sure you're all familiar with this project. And the photos that they would bring in was just like, you know, it, it was, <laughs> like, like, was well, my favorite was an A that was made out of a slice of pizza covered in saran wrap, like on a, on a Formica counter, you know, and I'm like, oh dear, like that's not a very visually engaged environment, you know, so like I think I, I, you know, as much as uh, uh, we, you know, we have kind of, we do, we do get kind of grumpy about these things, like they are a huge help for students to see a much wider range of, of things and have their hands on a much wider range of things so that they see better examples. Can, can I respond to that? I think that's, I totally agree with you. I've been seeing that. It's such an increase in like, strong art. Could you speak up, please? Yeah, sure. Thank I, you. I can stand as well. <laughs> oh, that's <laughs> <laughs> I'm out into it. Everybody calls me. Uh, and so I've been seeing that a lot. At the same time, take the responsibility of checking all process because there's a tremendous amount of you know, copying, yeah. plagiarism that you're never going to know because somebody saw a blog in Australia and said, I like that design and you're not going to find yeah. that. <laughs> right? So I have to like, double back, can I see how you got to this? Mm -hmm. And that's something that I've been really pressuring lately because mm -hmm. on a few instances it's been where the actual artist called the school and said, that's for me. Mm -hmm. right? wow. And so I won't tell you what's cool, but that has happened and we investigated it's happened and nobody that. And so that's one of the things to just watch out. And I found that when I take a look at a process book or journal, that's part of the project. It's really helpful. Mm -hmm. so, thank you. Yeah, but that kind of problem exists with people who are too. Uh, There's a yeah. CA print. Of course, all the annuals. All those annuals. Yeah. So, so that, it, yeah, yeah, that's, but you can, it's a little bit more, I don't know, it's just available, right? Yeah. yeah. I think there's another question. I'm joining a conversation from the publisher side, so I'm not even education. <coughs> and I was wondering if anyone on the panel could speak to how you guys would um, deal with issues of copyright and licensing around fonts. I, I have to say I work with a lot of designers, and they you know, join our, our teams really lacking knowledge around copyright. So I think that's a big, I think that's a big issue, um, and I think it's something that, as educators, we have a real responsibility to do because when we let them out in the world and we don't educate them about the fact that, you know, 
real people <laughs> make type, right? It's the amazing Nina. Nina makes this type for you, you know, like that's amazing. And if, if they're not even aware of, of the licensing issues, um, I, I think it's a major problem. I, I, I don't have a, a good response except to say that I, I, you know, it's something that we all share as a responsibility <laughs> to, to show them even how much it costs our schools to license type. Um, and I think for, for, I mean, I know for us, we have so many seats, we have actual labs with computers in them. So we license type and it's extremely expensive for schools to, to license. So if we want to purchase type from a foundry, even with educational licenses, it becomes really expensive. So <coughs> even having some of that um, transparency can, can be beneficial. But yeah, just recognizing that like, there are type designers that make this stuff that, you know, downloading these fonts for free actually damages things in the long run. I have, I have a comment on that, if I may. Uh, I teach, uh, teach currently not typography, but type design at, at Yale. And um, one thing that is really, really good at telling people, telling, teaching students um, why fonts cost money is getting them to try to make one. I've had students who came in with their laptops full of you know, fonts that they were looking at for research. You know. And at the end of the semester, they were like, actually, now I kind of know why I get a bit of an impression of how incredibly much work is in all of this stuff. So I think education in, in that part of the process too can actually do a lot to, to raise awareness. Um, actually, I was curious to ask Thomas a question about how being a type designer, how that benefits teaching typography. Yeah, well, about you know your point about experiencing the uh, making type and yeah, concretely understanding the labor required to do it. I am teaching type design as well in Queens College, and that's exactly what's happening too. You know, this is so much work. This is so nuts. It's like yeah, it's not going to get paid. So that I find personally, oh, this in second Troy, just on your point about licensing, it's easier to treat by experience, right? I probably you know meditating on it more. Uh, I think always more can be done stated at the type one level or type two level to explain that. I know personally in, in type design being taught, it's very easy. It's a very easy sell because they're experiencing themselves actually making the work. Um, Troy, now your question about um, my experience as a type design teaching type one class. So one is definitely it influences my methodology, right? Because I show at the type forms and like make them go through that experience of learning what it is and what the stuff is and then scaling up. Um, I think another thing, another aspect is, is just understanding the idea of systems that's been talked about. It. As for me, the way we think about systems is a different scale. We don't think we think about it in different ways, but we still think about it as systems. So I find for me, like my goal in my course is to get to get to come to that conclusion. And that happens at the end. That's the big reveal when they make their production, make their books, their posters, and all that, with a really strong foundation built in. Um, it's kind of a labor of love in that sense. Because it's a, it's a little exhausting to have to then keep extrapolating out from something I know very comfortably. But I find for me that I, I, the students do better work when I teach it that way. But also, I mean, I'm, as a book designer, like I mostly design books, and that's what I do. And I, it, it's not really up to me 99% uh, of the time. Like the, the publisher will often start me off with a contract that says, we bought the Adobe Linotype Library in 1998, mm -hmm. and if you'd like to use one of these, Class, please do so. And if you're not, then you know we need to talk. And <laughs> it's an open invitation to to skirt skirt the system because like you're basically told like you can't use a typeface that's been tested in a contemporary typesetting environment um, in order to make a book, which is just kind of awful in some ways. And, and so I don't know at what point. I mean, we can we can we can as faculty lecture our students, and then as designers we can lecture our clients. But you know, unless I don't know, like unless like people, unless publishers, readers really feel like it's important, and they feel it's important enough to spend like four hundred dollars as part of the budget, you know, on a typeface. I don't know how you really solve that. Like that's it's a. I mean, but things are also like I feel like the problem's going to solve itself in some ways, not in the best way. But you know, like we don't we don't buy type for our machines anymore because everything is through creative uh, through type cloud, through type kit, and you can download the stuff through type kit. 
so like we've kind of gone like the Uber route for like Titan in general, like in, in a, it's better, but it's kind of worse in other ways, but at least it does open up, at least it gets away, it gets us away from that line of type problem that we've, we've been wrestling with for forever. Like every year I used to, when I was directing at Parson, like somebody would come and say, we need to buy like 50 typefaces for like the machines. And I'm like, which machines are you talking about? Because students are using 500 different machines across the school. Like which one, what about their laptop? You want me to buy one for their laptop? Like, you know, there's no, the, the systems are not, the system that is working now is like one that's gonna come with different problems, but, um, but I think you know, even for publishing, like it'll help when everybody's on Creative Cloud and then there's Kit and whatever, and like maybe you can convince somebody to, you know, even though it, it makes it makes it gives Adobe an enormous amount of control though over a domain that we didn't previously control, and actually we should all be very concerned. About that, so. I'm actually glad there have been some lawsuits about type use because that gives us stories to tell and inspire fear. I think it's a big issue, but I also love what you're doing with Type Thursday. You did start at Type Thursday? Yes, that's correct. So I love what you're doing with Type Thursday. And I'm just, you know, because it's open, it's really crowded, there's a lot of young people, it's really kind of moving and growing. So I'm curious about what you feel is sort of the vibe in the, in the, meetings and everybody's designing time so What's they're not making money well, they're, they're, or are they? They're, most of our audience is actually type users so they're branding graphic design you know actually a minority of type designers usually about 25 percent 10 to 15 percent of the audience and we're in different cities we're in new york san francisco and la uh, so type designers are a minority of the group um, it's mainly type users in the majority but you know I, I think people very much have been growing and expanding a lot, I think, and I think the big note is, well, there's a couple of things. One is just your own interest in type in general. That's the big thing. That was a big bit on type there is that it's much more, it could be, it's a lot of people are interested in we take for credit. Uh, I think I've met people who are urban planners who come to our events. It's really weird. I'm like, really? Urban planning? <laughs> You're here. Apparently they, yeah, apparently signage and whatever, mm -hmm. wayfinding, who knew? Um, I think it's very. I think it's a great. It's like a great moment where we got like people are wanting to learn more. And I think my interest in teaching in general is this idea of they're going to learn one way or the other. You might as well do the right way, like the way that it can serve them the best, uh, with the best information possible, in a way that might it can scale up to be serving a lot of people in a more than just me one on one teaching them per se. Yeah, so that's what I can say about Type Thursday. So if there's no more questions, let's um, socialize. <laughs> have a glass of, socialize some more. Have a glass of wine, a cheese steak, some water.